whose purpose is to inspire others to live life to the fullest. Adam spent 20 years in a federal prison, transforming his life while compiling an extensive list of extraordinary and compelling achievements. Adam is highly regarded as an expert in crisis management, conflict resolution, and leadership. Please help me welcome Adam Clausen. into the new year. How many of you have resolutions? It's going to be the best year ever. Oh, yeah. And I heard you have things in. So for all of you, uh, I resolve this year not to make any resolutions. Not to resolve because I believe it's about what you do on a daily basis. It's our habits that define us. And Hello? up here, gritability. Hey. I can't claim you uh, to have coined that term. That's yeah. my wife. That's me. She is the brains in this pair. Um, she's also my inspiration. But gritability well defines the skill of persevering and finding a way to thrive even in the face of great adversity. You just heard a little bit of my background. A little bit of my background. Um, readability is the reason that I'm here. It's the things that I was willing to do on a daily basis to become the person that I needed to be in order to live the life that I envisioned for myself. How many of you in this room have, have made some mistakes? You know? <laughs> do, do mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> Several, right? Um, as young men, we tend to make an inordinate amount of mistakes. Sometimes we may have to crisis, sometimes we slide through without consequence. For me, uh, I had plenty of opportunity as, as a young man. I really could have done anything with my life. I chose to commit a string of robberies that ultimately landed me in federal prison with a 213 year sentence. Now when I tell you that I made a choice, I should give you a little bit of background, where that decision came from. It was an act of desperation. It was feeling a sense of hopelessness, despair, not being able to see a year in advance, let alone a week in advance. When I was 18 years old, I got connected to a group of other young men who I can say negatively influenced me, took me from the path of instead of going to college, I went to the school of hard knocks, you would say. I ended up in the state prison. I spent almost four years in the state prison where I attained my, G, my GED, I took some college classes. I even picked up a trade, became a carpenter. I don't think I look like a carpenter. It wasn't necessarily the life that I envisioned for myself, but my choices that had led me there kind of dictated, or so I thought that that was the only route left for me. So I spent four years 18 to 21, almost 22, trying to figure out what the rest of my life was gonna look like. As most people were in college, having that natural exploration, building professional networks or building their social networks that would ex take them on to the next stage of life, I built a very different network. I built a network of negative associations that were waiting for me the minute I walked out the door. And if I'm being honest about it, I didn't give my second chance at life, I didn't really give myself much of an opportunity. Within a few weeks of going to that job, of trying to be a carpenter, I gave up. I went right back to the same people, 
doing the same things. And ultimately, I spent a couple of years living on the fringes where I was on supervision, I was reporting, trying to act like I was doing the right thing, trying to figure out what I was gonna do with my life because I was completely lost and broken. I didn't know what was wrong with me, and I didn't know what I needed to be made whole again. So I used drugs, I used alcohol, things to mask the pain, the lack of fulfillment that I felt inside. Ultimately, that led to me being reincarcerated. I was rearrested, I was put in the county jail for 90 days. 90 days. The judge said, this is an opportunity for you to get yourself cleaned up, get back on track. Still a, still a young man with my whole life ahead of me. That 90 days taught me how fragile my existence was. Because when I walked out the door, my car that had been sitting on the street had been impounded and repossessed. My phone had been turned off. My house had been sold out from underneath me and all of my belongings thrown in trash bags and discarded. I literally walked out of that county jail with a bill for the cost of my incarceration. It was like $1,500. I didn't have money for a phone call. You remember the pay phones? Did we still use change? I walked in flip flops. <laughs> sweatpants and a t-shirt the last week in January this is on the east coast in New Jersey it was like 15 degrees I walked down the street to the McDonald's trying to make a phone call and I had to bum change from someone who was working at McDonald's because I didn't even have that I made a decision I made a phone call instead of calling family people that I knew loved me and wanted the best for me, I called someone else. I called a friend who picked me up and over the course of the next three weeks, feeling a sense of despair, hopelessness, I committed a string of robberies. I committed a string of robberies in downtown Philadelphia and ultimately when the federal, uh, the FBI caught up with me, they told me, you're looking at life in prison. Over 200 years. I said, I know this game. I'm 23 years old at this time. I'm seasoned. I know how the system works. When I got back, when I got into federal holding, and I looked at the law books, and I realized that they could give me hundreds of years for what I had done, I realized that realized it was a little too late at that point. Plenty of regret, plenty of remorse, but from that point forward, I had to make a decision. Was I going to continue to live from that place of hopelessness and despair, or was I gonna hold on to that glimmer of hope that someday, some point, regardless of all the odds stacked against me, that I might get a second chance. I went to trial, I lost, I received 213 years, and I found myself in the United States Federal Penitentiary behind 40 foot walls with some of the most notorious people, most notorious criminals in the country, people who were likewise serving life sentences. There was very, very little hope. There was very little opportunity to do anything positive. I had to create space, a physical space, which in prison is very valuable. Real estate. Any real estate people in here? Hey. <laughs> You really, you know that we are running out of land here in Nevada, and who said what? Yeah. That's a surprise. 
and we are running out of land here in Las Vegas. They plan to make the whole southern tip of Nevada the metropolitan Las Vegas area by 2035. Well, we'll see if that happens. So, real estate in prison. I learned a little bit about real estate. I learned that scarcity of anything increases the value. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to have an individual who carved out physical space in that environment and allowed me to pursue my passion, to give me the space to operate outside of the conventional norms within that environment. That individual literally changed the trajectory of my life. I found a passion for fitness. For the first time in my life, I put down the drugs, I stopped drinking, I stopped getting high, I stopped smoking. I actually started sleeping. That was something that I didn't do much of prior to that. And as I adopted these healthy habits, and I started to feel a whole lot better physically, I noticed the effect that it had on me mentally. Mm -hmm. My physiology literally helped to improve my psychology. And over the course of the next 10 years, I learned everything that I possibly could about physiology, about human anatomy, about kinesiology. And despite that environment that I was in, with all of those dangerous individuals, and despite the things that I had done in my past that could have defined me, I found a new identity. I became a fitness guru. That, my passion, finally came to the surface. And in that environment, I found a sense of purpose being able to share that passion with others. And the more that I saw other people value that, the more inspired I was to continue to contribute, to give back. It was the first time in my life, instead of taking, I was able to give something. And I felt good about that. And I know this is gonna sound a little crazy, but for the first time in my life, I found peace behind 40 foot walls of the United States Penitentiary, surrounded by some of the most dangerous individuals in the entire country, I found peace. How crazy is that? But that's what it took. And then, against all odds, I found someone who believed in me. Now, unusual place for a love story to be in. And it's not what you would think. This wasn't a prison card. <laughs> it wasn't, it's not that kind of love story. No, no. I still vividly recall one day, a guy walks in and I see him, big bodybuilder. Remember, I'm the fitness guru. Big bodybuilder comes in and he said, yeah, this is, this guy was one up, Mr. New Jersey. I said, wow. Definitely want to connect with him. And we hit it off. We were both from the East Coast. You know, people from all across the country. So we're both from New Jersey, same place. Come to find out his girlfriend is gonna take the trip three and a half hours to come up and see him each week. And hey, she's got a friend. <laughs> so when he describes this friend and her lap spread, I gotta admit, I got a little intimidated. I'm like, um, Sure, we can talk. And they had just introduced an email system. We got to corresponding back and forth. And for the first time in my life, I developed a relationship purely on communication. Because if I'm being honest about it, every relationship I had prior to that was extremely shallow. That's the reality. So that circumstance gave me the opportunity to develop the relationship that I never knew was even possible. What I was missing 
and for some reason, she saw something in me, I don't know. Um, a guy serving a life sentence. First, in prison, that's, that's the first flag, right? You don't wanna date a guy in prison. The second flag is, hey, he's doing life. He's not coming home. Well, I don't know, ladies, maybe that sounds like a favorite one. Right, there might be some benefit to that. Way too much laughter in the room. So, for whatever reason, we connect despite the circumstances. Mainly over a shared passion for fitness, but we shared our hopes, our dreams, our vision for the future, wanting to have a family. Scary things to share under normal circumstances to open up to be vulnerable, but to do it under those circumstances, I guess part of that was maybe I felt right I had nothing to lose. And for the first time in my life, I was willing to open up and acknowledge what I needed. There was a need to be loved, to be accepted, and as men, we don't generally acknowledge those things very openly. Not with each other, not publicly, but I'm the first to say that's what I needed. When I look back, and many of those bad decisions that I made, ultimately what was driving me was a need to be loved, to be accepted, those things that had been unfulfilled. That sense of hopelessness, despair, that's where that stemmed from. So now, I mean, here's, here's the great tragedy of the situation. I finally figure it out, but I still have life sentence. And for any of you who know anything about criminal justice reform in this country, this was still in the area where we were very much tough on crime. And I don't know where you stand, you might be a supporter of that, but I can tell you that many of the sentencing policies that were adopted back then put people in prison for much, much longer than they needed to be. And it's hard to hold on to hope. But despite there being no opportunity for parole, no chance, we knew that we either had to get Congress to change the law or find a president who was willing to sign off and let me out of prison. There's not too many presidents who are gonna be brave enough to take a chance on someone who has repeatedly made the same mistakes and shown little you know, chance for rehabilitation. But we held on to hope, we talked about our dreams, our hopes, and we developed a sense of readability. What do I mean by that? For us, readability is that skill, which means persevering on a daily basis, doing difficult things that we didn't necessarily enjoy, as part of anybody in here, we have any fitness people? You get up, you run, you go to the gym, you do those things every day. Even when you don't enjoy it, I run every single morning still to this day. I do not like it. You know why I run? I run because I read many years ago that neurogenesis is a real product of that, that you will get smarter if you run. I said, I need to get smarter. So I'm gonna run. Simple fact, but I knew that all the other health benefits, right? So doing difficult things on a daily basis, seeing the progress that you can make, that can generate a sense of hope, of ability, realizing that we all have so much potential that is rarely tapped into. It generally goes unused. So I just ran you through the first 10 years, a decade of my life behind that wall. I got a break. I got moved to a medium security facility, which is a step down. Seems like a nicer place. And any of you ever heard of Club Fed? Yeah, it wasn't that place. It wasn't that place. I've heard about those places, I've never seen them. Right, this is the furthest thing from it. 
But guess what? I got to hold my future wife's hand. Aww. Hold her hand. That was the most intimate contact I had ever had with a woman. Ten years and I got to sit there holding her hand. And that inspired me to get up, to get out there every single day, to do what I needed to do, to take another step closer to fulfilling our dreams. I spent the next 10 years developing the relationships that I needed to support me in becoming the best version of myself, developing the skills. I became a certified life coach, a Fender Workforce Development Specialist, a certified personal trainer, group trainer, Schwinn indoor spin instructor, everything health and fitness related you can imagine. And I acquired all of these skills, things that I was passionate about that I knew fed into my sense of purpose, which over time I started to realize was to ensure that others didn't end up caught up in that same cycle that I was stuck in. Because I realized that there were many other people in prison, very much with a very similar story to mine, who just didn't see any opportunity. They didn't have that sense of hope. And what I learned over time was that I was able to help inspire them, to help them make better decisions. And I said, I wish someone would have done this for me all those years ago. But now it's my responsibility. So I spent 10 years building a community of other incarcerated life coaches who transformed the culture, not just of that prison, but who have since gone on to do amazing work all across the country. I watched them go out, succeed, impact their communities, and I sat in prison, waiting for that opportunity, holding on to hope that eventually one common sense would prevail because I didn't tell you exactly what my crimes were. I committed a string of violent armed robberies. Terrible. I deeply, deeply regret all of those actions. Fortunately, no one was seriously injured. No one was killed. I'm, I am truly <coughs> grateful for that because I put people's lives in danger. And I subjected my family, victims, all sorts of people on the peripheral. I subjected them to <coughs> trauma, that came along with whether it was me being incarcerated or whether it was what they were subjected to during that crime. Very, very serious. But I was hopeful that someday I would be granted an opportunity, a second chance, a third chance to be more precise. Eventually that day came where I was allowed to be heard for the things that I accomplished. I accomplished things in prison that had never been accomplished before. Many, many firsts. I'm not going to run down that list of firsts because that's not important. What is important is that what was available to me is no longer available to anyone else, which is tragic. The people that believed in me helped me to win that second chance. One of those individuals was an attorney who was a former federal bank robber. He had committed his crimes, robbed a string of banks, gotten out of prison, went to law school, became a Georgetown law professor, and a frequent guest at the White House. I'm very grateful that he is a close, dear friend who was able to help Congress reform that law to make sure that others could never be sentenced the way that I was sentenced. And he was also able to advocate on my behalf <coughs> to make sure that I was awarded what's called a compassionate release. On August 12, 2020, I was awarded compassionate release, and it was meant to be immediate release, although it wasn't quite immediate. 72 hours later, you know, it's the government, it takes a little bit. No offense to anyone that works in government. You know, sometimes the wheels turn slowly. And all of this time, my chief advocate, my supporter, she never gave up on me. Yeah. And she was there with the car packed, waiting 
when I walked out the door and holding on to her for the first time made it all worthwhile. Everything that we went through up to that point, it was the realization of all of that work day after day after day for 11 years. She continued to believe despite the ups and downs. Having that level of support inspired me not only to become the person that I needed to be, but to get up on those days when I didn't feel like it. When I said, you know what, there's three feet of snow out there. It's cold. It's, we're up in northwestern Pennsylvania. Anybody know Buffalo area? I'm sure you've seen it on the news. It's freezing. There's snow. The tracks that were made on that track were generally only mine. And I took great pride in that being willing to do what others won't so that I could achieve and have the life that I envisioned for myself. So since I've been released, we moved out here to Vegas. When I tell you she picked me up with the car packed, it was literally to start a new life here in Las Vegas. And Las Vegas is now home. We absolutely love it here. We feel like this is home. We just spent two weeks out in New Jersey and couldn't wait to get back here. <laughs> right? um, so grateful to be here, to have this new life. I'm sorry, I didn't even use a clicker. <laughs> and I'm not sure. Oh. Are we gonna get another side, maybe? Maybe not. That's okay. I need the side. <laughs> so, readability is a term that we came up with to define what it was that we needed to get us through those difficult times. We started a podcast talking about the power of perseverance, highlighting other stories, because we were greatly inspired by so many other people who had done incredible things. And when I look at the key components of what readability is made up of, there's four things. Conviction. My conviction defines me. And when I'm talking about my conviction, I'm not talking about my criminal conviction. Although I own that, my conviction is my belief. That belief that I have in myself, in my ability, and where does that stem from? That strong belief stems from going out there and doing things that I didn't think it was possible. I ran 26.2 miles. Any marathon runners in here? Wow. Half marathon, that's impressive. I did it on an oval track. Three times around was a mile in prison. I did it first and foremost to prove to myself what I was capable of after being told so many times that I wasn't worthy, that I couldn't do something. I needed to prove to myself and also very publicly, I wanted to prove it to others. So conviction is first and foremost, right? Having that strong sense of faith and belief in yourself and not being afraid to share that openly. The second thing is courage, right? The courage of conviction. Being able to do that thing, not only repeatedly, but when everyone else is going the other way. I was that guy standing at the door when it was minus 20 degrees and the snow was out there. They're looking at me and telling me, like, you're crazy. What are you doing? I said, this is my routine, this is what I need to do, I'm gonna stay healthy, like I'm just gonna go get it. Coming into social situations, I don't drink. When most people drink, I've made a decision not to do it. Doing those things that are against conventional norms, that's having the courage to hold on to what's dear to you, and having the courage to openly proclaim it, not to hide it. That's critical. The third C is your commitment, right? Commitments are, I am finding more and more frequently as of late, 
people don't hold them as dear as they used to. Mm -hmm. When's the last time you did a handshake deal? I don't see any hands. <laughs> a lot of contracts, right? Did one Friday? Okay. Congratulations. Whoever you're dealing with, I applaud you and that person. Having that level of integrity, that commitment, when you give your word to someone, that means something. I shouldn't have had to learn that in prison. But I did. Valuable lesson. The commitments that I have made to myself, first and foremost, allowed me to maintain the confidence and respect that I had for myself, that level of integrity. But then keeping my word to others, even when it would have been easy to do otherwise, that's credibility. And the last one, the last C is consistency. To bring us back full circle to where we started, when I talked about resolutions, not resolving to say, this year's gonna be better and I'm gonna do things differently. I said, just buckle down and do it day after day after day. And that's how, after 20 years, five months, 17 days, that's why I was awarded a second chance, an opportunity to live into the life of my dreams. I had to earn that. And believe me, I weighed that out every day. Have I done enough to make amends for all the harm that I did in my past? Because believe me, I did more than what I was going to do. I mean, there were plenty of things I didn't get caught for, like, right? We get away with some things, right? So, have I done enough to make amends for all of my past? And have I done enough time, right? Equity. Have I done that? And when I got to that point, 20 years, 5 months, 17 days, I felt confident in the fact of, I think I've earned a second chance. But if I am granted this, there's a responsibility that comes along with it. There's a great weight that I carry on a daily basis because there are many people that are left behind who weren't afforded that second chance. I slid out of crack this morning. And I got a phone call a year after I had been out from my attorney, that Georgetown law professor, who said, today would have been the day. If the government would have appealed your case, and to anyone's knowledge, mine is the only case that was not appealed, I would have gone back to prison. Despite the fact that I had a one-year-old son at home. Despite the fact that I was living the life of my dreams, living up to every commitment that I made to my wife, to my family, to all of the other people that I had given my word to, I would have been going back. So I carry that weight of responsibility every single day with me. And it weighs heavy. But with that comes the opportunity that I now have to serve as an advocate. There were a number of people that I spoke to in the room who have their own stories, their own background. The reality is at this point, statistics bear out that everyone in this room has a family member, has a friend, has someone in their life who've been touched by the criminal justice system. It's an unfortunate reality. That's the area that we live in. So what are we doing to improve that? To make sure individuals like me, that 20 something year old, doesn't end up right back in that cycle, only doesn't have the same sense of hope that I held on to. They give up because believe me, I saw a lot of that. So now I have the opportunity to work with individuals coming out of the system. There are over 6,000 individuals, 6,000 released from our criminal justice system to Las Vegas, just here in Las Vegas, every year. It's a lot of people, right? It's our county jails, that's our prisons, that's the federal system, they're all coming back here. So what are we doing to support them? 
my partner, Michelle, and I, and our new office manager, Jennifer, have a staffing agency, Rise Together Staffing. And what we do is we assist those individuals in their transition back into the workforce. We connect them with second chance employers who understand the value of that big experience of good ability. Because what I hear from employers every single day is that our current workforce, at the first sign of adversity, tapping out. No call, no show. This job isn't for me. I need to find something easier. Well, I can tell you where to find those people that you can count on. Those people who've been through great adversity, who've been tested, come out the other side stronger, more resilient as a result. Those are the individuals that I have the privilege of working with every single day. They just need someone to believe in. The second thing that we do, which basically goes hand in hand, we do housing or we're in the process of getting into housing. Let me clarify that. We have what's called the Qualified Opportunity Zone Fund. We're working with the city of North Las Vegas to develop 250 affordable housing units along with space for community service providers and other partners who want to help revitalize the community and do so in a way that is sustainable long-term, that does not rely on government funding, that relies on economic development, long-term revenue production that lifts the entire community up. There's a ton of support for what we are doing now. We're in the final stages of that uh, vetting process. Feeling very optimistic. It was a challenging year getting to where we are right now. But housing, having a safe space. I told you how valuable that piece of real estate I had was in prison. Talk about the value of real estate. That's why I knew when I got out, I wanted to play a role in real estate, making sure that individuals coming out had the safe space that they needed to become or to live into their full potential. The staffing agency is meant to be a support to make sure that individuals who invest in our fund, to make sure you can get your money back. Because everybody loves social impact, but they all wanna know that they're gonna see a return on investment as well. So we sought to address both issues, housing and employment. And then my passion project. My passion project is credibility. It's a podcast that my wife and I have where we share some of our stories, some of the challenges that we faced, how we built the relationship that we have, which I don't know about the relationship that you're in, but 11 years, while incarcerated, 10 of those years driving six and a half hours just to come hold my hand for a little bit. Aww. Wow. <laughs> love. Any Stephen Covey fans in here? You want to see love living the way that a mother sacrifices for her child or the way that a prison wife sacrifices for her husband? That commitment inspired me to become the person that I always was meant to be. Credibility is us sharing not only our story, but having the stories of others who have sim overcome similar incredible challenges because I know how much I was inspired, especially when I was in those circumstances, and I needed those stories. You know, the media is filled with all sorts of negative doom and gloom mm -hmm. every single day. We don't hear enough inspiring stories, so we're seeking to promote more of those. And I'm sure that there are plenty of those stories right here in this room. Mine is just one of many. Right? We're always looking for additional stories that we can highlight. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, Readability is our passion project. You can find us on Instagram, on YouTube, anywhere on any of the podcast platforms. We'd love to have you join us for those. John, I think I can open this up for questions. Yeah. Is it questions for uh, Yes, ma'am, please. First, I just want to say thank you. It's got to be hard to get up there and share your innermost transparent, you know, secrets, if you will. So thank you for sharing that with us. I know that that's not easy. And just a 
someone who's had a family and friends who have been unfortunately touched by the um, incarceration system, if you want to call it that. Um, I know what it's like, and I think that that's amazing what you're doing. So I just, how have you gone about um, creating the system of staffing and and getting them the jobs and getting them the credibility to do that? Because I know, not personally, but like from other people, that it's very hard. It's like all you need is a chance sometimes. So how have you gone out and been able to foster that opportunity for them? Excellent question. Um, Fostering those opportunities has been far more challenging than I expected. Uh, I had the great pleasure and honor of being part of last year's Leadership Las Vegas class of 2022 through the Las Vegas Chamber. Through that came um, the promise of connection to many employers across you know, this area. There's over a similar number, that's 6,000, number keeps coming up. 6,000 committed second chance employers through the chamber, it has been a little bit more challenging to find them. There's generally um, requirements that come along with it. But again, this is what I feel, um, where I have the greatest sense of responsibility, and where I can make the greatest contribution as well. Because I know that I don't look the part. When you look at me, you don't see someone who spent over 20 years in prison. <coughs> You don't see someone who had a 213-year sentence. And I believe that's my gift, to be able to walk in and sit down with employers, with decision makers, to have a conversation about the value of bringing on someone with that lived experience to give them that chance. And then when that hesitation occurs, and there's often a comment of, well, you know, generally those people. And that's the opportunity for me to share that I'm one of those people. I am actually, like all the way here, you know, the people that generally get disqualified first. I'm a repeat violent offender. That's the reality. I'm the last person to get that opportunity. So hopefully it, it hits a little bit closer to home when I'm able to, to stand there and advocate on behalf of others, generally who don't have as severe charges as I've had, who haven't done as much time as I have, who are honestly far more deserving of that second chance. And it also helps that my partner, who unfortunately had to leave a little bit earlier, that she too has a criminal background. And if you looked at her, you would never guess that she too spent time in prison. And I guess that's the purpose here, right? To make sure that everyone realizes, as he said, it's touched all of us. It's touched our families. It's touched the people that we know. It's just one of those things that we don't talk about. And the more I'm able to bring this to light, to bring this into conversation, hopefully the more comfortable people become having the conversation, opening themselves up to at least considering giving someone a chance. Now, I'm not gonna lie. There's gonna be some letdown, right? How do you build trust? You gotta be willing to give trust, right? You have to open yourself up. And in doing so, at some point, you're gonna get burned. We've all been burned, right? That's just part of life. Not every, every person's gonna be a success. Not every story is gonna come out with a happy ending. But don't let that one be the deterrent. Right? We always impress that upon the first person that we get into a new employer, we let them know, like, you're, you're first through the door. You're here to set the standard. Like, whatever happens with you is going to determine whether that door stays open or closes and that opportunity is lost. And most of the people, most of our clients take that very seriously. That same responsibility I feel is impressed upon them. What is my IG? Yeah. Adam 213 is free. Yep. We're looking for credibility. And at credibility. Sorry, that was my personal IG. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's on top of it all. <laughs> 
Yes. Yesterday, uh, my dear friend, Judge Ellie Jihani, she's actually no longer a judge. Unfortunately, she lost this last election. Now she has the time to come with me to visit the county jail. I have the privilege of going in there each week. I go in every Monday morning. We have a housing unit with approximately fluctuates 40 to 60 women who are in there who have chosen to be a part of this program. It's called the SOAR program. And they choose to be a part of a more structured living environment as opposed to simply sleeping all day, trying to just wish and hope that things will get better. These women are doing the work on a daily basis. I have the privilege of going in there and working with them and working with the program officers. And all of these women or I'm sorry, the vast majority of them also need a safe space upon release. That's one of the things that we are definitely um, very eager to expand those resources because it just does not exist. The capacity is not there. And the number one disqualifier on a rental application is going to be a criminal conviction. It's an immediate disqualifier. Funny thing is, while my wife and I were traveling across the country, in that car packed up with all of our belongings, I can't tell you how many applications we put in for various rental properties, and when my name was on it, we were immediately disqualified. Now, none of them said that it was because of my conviction, but the funny thing is, the first time we took my name off, we suddenly got approved. So, and I deal with this every day. That criminal conviction should not be a, a barrier to providing safe space for people to successfully transition back into the community. Women especially are extremely vulnerable. And we generally do not have the resources for them. So that's why it's been great for us to be able to go over there 
to be a part of that program. There are some amazing program officers. The new sheriff, Sheriff Kevin McMahill, has given a, a full support, not only for that program, but for really being more actively, proactively involved in making sure that that cycle, especially with the county jail, constant flow in and out, that that cycle is disrupted, that there are additional resources. So I'm grateful as someone who is, you know, just a couple years out of prison, to be permitted to go in there and work with individuals, that's my sense of purpose. I'm grateful to be able to go in there and do that. I think that it's very helpful to have someone with a lived experience. There's a different level of credibility. So fortunate to have that. I would definitely love to continue that conversation. And with anyone else who's interested in learning more about real estate, the opportunities, there really is the potential to do well financially while doing a whole lot of good for your community that does exist. There's financial incentives, 2017 tax reform. That's what created qualified opportunity zones. That was the purpose, to draw capital gains to help revitalize communities. Greatly underutilized. Everybody looks for a live tax for, for the tax credits and affordable housing. But this is a vehicle. This is a vehicle that we can use to, to great benefit. So if you're an investor, I suggest please look into it, explore it. And if you're someone who's looking to get involved as a service provider, please let me know that as well. There are a ton of opportunities. We do a couple things. We think that we do them pretty well, but there are so many other service community providers in our community that do a phenomenal job. And we always look to connect with those uh, providers as well. Let's give out a vote.